welcome back to my channel. My name is Maria and today we are continuing to talk about Tudor millinery. In my last video we talked about sewing a Tudor coif, so today we're going to sew something a bit fancier to go on top of that. In particular we're going to be talking about a controversial piece of Tudor millinery, the French hood. The French hood is uh, very popular and appears in a lot of film and television, however we are not entirely sure how they were made and how they work. The uh, traditional understanding of the French hood has included a stiffened crescent, almost uh, like a visor. In fact, at my first ever Renaissance fair, I was advised to build a French hood using a visor as a base, cut off of uh, a baseball cap. However, there is a second theory that has come out a bit more recently. I believe it was put forward by Karen Margretha Hoskildson and uh, Melanie Schuster. The new theory suggests that instead of a, uh, a crescent similar to a tiara or a kakoshnik, the French hood actually consists of two main pieces. The first piece is going to be uh, similar to a coif. I believe in Scottish sources it is referred to as a chaffron sometimes, and it is basically a silk cap uh, with a gold frill set into it. The gold frill can disappear later in the period, but uh, for an earlier example, we've got the gold frill here, and uh, a decorative filament around the front edge, which can be made of uh, goldsmith's work, um, gold passing thread or wire or something like that, or it can be made of beads. And uh, for my red example, as well as my other example, I've used pearls. The second important component of the French hood is the actual hood instead of the veil that is attached to the crescent that we've seen in period pieces like Anne of a Thousand Days. And that hood looks like this. It is made of velvet, it's got a, uh, a tail instead of a veil, and the front edge also has a decorative filament. In my case I've gone with pearls again, however we also see things like uh, ouches or other gold work and more elaborate examples. However, I have gone with pearls for my French hood because I uh, have set out not to create just any French hood, but to recreate the French hood worn by Anne Boleyn in that one really famous portrait or family of portraits because there are a couple of copies. Anne Boleyn is possibly the first person who comes to mind when we talk about the French hood. She's credited with introducing the French hood to, uh, to the English court, however that may not be strictly true. The French hood actually goes back to the late 15th century and um, likely comes from Brittany. In particular it's associated with Anne of Brittany who was depicted wearing a French hood as far back as 1492 or 3. I think it's 92, uh, but I'll put it on the screen if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, after that it comes to the English court, possibly via Mary Tudor after her first marriage and her time spent in France. However, it would be correct to say that Anne Boleyn popularized the style, and it may to an extent have been associated with her. We know that Jane Seymour banned her ladies-in-waiting from wearing the French hood after she became queen. We do know that Anne Boleyn purchased and wore French hoods. We see them in that one iconic portrait of her in the black. And uh, we know from her household documents that she spent up to nine pounds on a French hood, which was not cheap back then. However, it is worth noting that the one image we have created during her lifetime that is not massively disputed is a commemorative medal from 1534, which shows her wearing a gable hood or English hood. We also know she may have worn a gable hood to her execution and for her coronation. And it is entirely possible that she switched over to the more conservative and English style after her marriage. However, she did bring French fashions with her from the French court when she moved over uh, to join Henry's court, and uh, it is believed that Henry fell in love in part with her Frenchness. The first potential layer of the French hood is actually not made of silk or velvet. It is uh, a linen coif like the one I'm wearing. However, I'm not going to go into the construction of this coif in this video because we just did that. Moving on to the silk coif. There is one big difference between the silk coif pattern and the pattern of the coif I'm currently wearing. The problem is a lot of coifs we have left over from the 16th century show a seam on the top of the head. 
The problem with that approach to the chaperon design is that we do not see that seam in depictions of the French hood. So we need to uh, find an approach to this that doesn't put that seam on the top of the head. We don't have extant chaperons, we don't really have great sources as to what they might have looked like, so a lot of this is guesswork. However, uh, the pattern I've ended up using is quite similar to that used by uh, Isabel Northwood Costumes and Samantha Bullitt, with uh, just a couple of really tiny changes. So I think there's a kind of consensus going on. This is our best guess at the moment, uh, without further information or extant pieces. To begin with, I cut my pattern out of black linen and out of black silk taffeta. I wanted it to be lined to give it a bit more um, crispness, a bit more moxie, and uh, to further protect it, as well as providing a stronger base for any decoration attached to it. Uh, so I've cut this out twice and I've basted the layers together because I've decided to flatline it and treat everything as one layer. I don't know if this is correct, maybe I should have baglined it, but we don't really have evidence either way and I prefer flatlining so that is what I did. Once everything is basted together, I folded it in half and pinned along the new back seam, which is no longer the top seam. And I sewed that up using a back stitch. Once I had that seam sewn, I ironed it open uh, so that the silk was kind of on top or most visible, and felled both sides down to uh, reduce bulk, rather than felling everything to one side, which I think would have given me quite a chunky seam. Uh, and I felt that all down with a whip stitch and ironed it flat again. So the next thing I had to worry about was the drawstring casing. Because I wanted points uh, that come down to about here, I don't know anatomical terms, but this kind of point on my jaw, I didn't want to run the drawstring casing through the entire bottom of the coif. Therefore, what I did was uh, sew eyelets uh, just above the bottom of the coif so that I can run the threads through uh, and they come out here. So this center section of the chaffron has a drawstring, as you can see, and can be gathered up small to make the, uh, the chaffron fit my head. But this little section here has no, uh, has no drawstring and is just straight. Once I had that done, I folded up the seam allowance along the bottom of the coif and uh, hemmed it down with a whip stitch to create the drawstring casing. With that done, I moved on to hemming the, uh, the front, the part of the chaperon that goes around the face. I did a much narrower hem on that part because it doesn't need to accommodate a drawstring, and uh, I used a whip stitch to do that again. Finally, we've got the awkward little section at the back of the hood. Uh, if you've put it together correctly, there should be a little hole at the back of the hood. And I closed that up by uh, running two parallel running stitches along that sort of extra fabric and using that to gather it up. Once that was done, I secured my gathers in place with a back stitch. Uh, you can see it's a bit messy before it was ironed, but once I had everything ironed down, we've got these neat little uh, whipped in place gathers that pull everything together at the back of the hood. This is where I kind of diverged from what other creators have done because they've used a uh, slightly less complicated finish, but I find this finish really neat and um, I like how it turned out, so that's what I did. 
we have a chaperone that is wearable and in one piece, so all that is left to do is decorate it. And that brings us to my least favorite part of the French hood process, which is the gold frill. In a lot of images of the French hood, we see a gold frill around the, uh, the front edge of the chaperone the front edge of the French hood. The most common approach to this frill seems to be pleating, and in particular cartridge pleating. We don't really seem to see flat knife pleats or straight up gathering in a lot of period images. I know uh, Isabel Northwood Costuming seems to have done cartridge pleating, and that is also the approach I went with. In order to do that, I ran three running stitches along the entire length of the gold frill. Um, instead of doing them all at one end, I put uh, gathering stitches along both sides and one down the middle. Once that was all done, I gathered it as tight as possible, so it was all scrunched up on the, uh, the gathering threads, and then I steamed it so it would hold that sort of crisper shape. After that, I let my gold frill back out a bit, uh, so that it would fit along the front edge of my chaffron, and I whip stitched it in place using gold silk thread. You may notice that I did not take out those gathering stitches, and they are in fact visible at the front edge of the hood. We do see that in some period portraiture, and it seems like a safe, surefire way to make sure your uh, gold frill doesn't go stray. So I decided to uh, leave those stitches in place because I was sick of the gold frill and I did not want another disaster. The final step, or second to last step technically, I guess, of my chaperone was for me the most fun, and that was decorating the front edge. We know bilaments could have been made out of uh, a variety of materials. I think a gold braided stitch would be a lot of fun. However, I wanted to match that portrait of Anne Boleyn, and so I used the largest pearls that I had in my stash, which I still don't think were quite large enough. I used a slightly weird technique to put the beads on, which I took from a website about German Renaissance costuming, and I will link that tutorial below because I think it explains it better than I can. The basic technique, however, is to thread three beads onto the string and uh, only really secure down every third bead with something like a backstitch. I finished off my chaperone by adding some tapes strategically. The first is this long piece of black linen tape from the Tudor Tailor which I just ran through the casing using a very tiny safety pin this time. Um, and the other bit of tape that I added was uh, a piece of tape that I basted in, or kind of tacked in under the chin, because I still don't trust my hair to support the weight of a French hood. And uh, with a little chin strap, I have a slightly more secure foundation for everything else. I recommend using a pin to hold the chin strap in place. Again, pins are not as scary as they sound, and I haven't stabbed myself in the face yet. Um, it's also less bulky than something like a hook and eye, although if you are really uncomfortable with a pin up in your face, I'm sure there are other viable solutions. So that is my finished coif. Um, I have some photos of the coif worn. And uh, in my next video, I'm going to talk about sewing the French hood to go on top of it. Thank you very much if you've watched this far. I really appreciate it. Uh, please do like, comment, and subscribe if you've enjoyed this video. I've also linked my Instagram in the description, as well as my Kofi. It's pronounced Kofi, I think. Um, in case you'd like to support this channel and help me make more videos going forward. Thank you again for watching. I will see you again very soon with the second part of this French hood experience. Uh, but for now, have a nice day and uh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know where that was going. <laughs>